So this is a episode, I call them episodes, episode 29. Our superior father, John Hannan, a great man, by the way, had warned us in Novitius that celibates needed human love and friendship. Non-exclusive, non-genital, spiritual friendships are good for celibates. So long as the relationship remains open and honest, there are risks. When you're 19, a sexual attraction can occur. Are you saying we could fall in love with one another? Asked a novice. Yes, he had said. Freud taught us that relatively few people are exclusively heterosexual or homosexual. Most people are somewhere along the spectrum. Even if this is theoretical to you now, before long it won't be. In winter 1982, it happened to me. My journal of that autumn shows an earnest 20 year old struggling with religious endeavor disappointed with meditation, meditation difficult, distracted a fair bit, ended by thanking God for a day, not very successful. I visited my father's grave on All Souls Day. I may still have been having the recurring dream of his being about to tell me something important, but culminating in the silence of the grave. I wrote to the Salvation Army uh, missing persons office, letting them know that we had found my brother David. I had a new spiritual director, an honourable Marist. On the 5th of November, after making my confession to him, I like this bit, after making my confession to him, we discussed my occasional, quote unquote, atheistic tendencies and views. <laughs> ah, yes, the rush was there from the start. However, I remember being underwhelmed by his argument that I could doubt God, quote, but that doesn't alter his existence. Applied to the proverbial flying pink elephant, doubting the airborne, um, I can't pronounce that word, proboscidean, you know, to do with elephants, doesn't alter his existence either. He still doesn't exist. And no sensible adult stakes his life on belief in Dumbo. My new pastor work was to befriend two long-term in inmates in Arbor Hill Prison. I found it intimidating walking into the austere building, its massive steel doors clanging shut, locked behind me. We had privileged, privileged access to the men, meeting them alone in their cells. Unlike the String Them Up Brigade, I realised that I was no better than these prisoners, just luckier. Although I have in recent years won awards for public speaking, I was far from that in my early years in Milltown. Faced with a packed congregation during the Vicious, my legs used to shake dramatically, my mouth dried, my lungs, my lungs clamped, and I blushed like a beacon. The problem remained two years later. I, I journaled in November 1982. On Saturday at Eucharistic Adoration, I had a near heart attack prior to reading. An entry for the 24th of November reads, almost vomiting uh, with nerves about driving test. But the mood changes with an entry of the 30th of November. Lord, praise be your name now and forever. My pass for work at the prison had gone well the previous night. I passed my driving test and I, th and I thanked God for, quote, the pleasure and the company and the companionship of home on Sunday. For sure, this could not refer to my mother. And so I deduce that a confrere had accompanied me. And then Saturday, Alleluia, Amen, effuses the journal. Thank you, Lord, I praise you for the beauty and the treasure of my precious hours and moments spent in deep intimacy. Lest the reader think that I had just lost my virginity, I had not. Far from it. The intimacy in question was the first budding of a short-lived six-month on-off affective and emotional crush, but something nevertheless more real than cultivating a relationship with an imagined pink elephant. My journal records my inner certainty, stability and delight, and my awareness of beauty and love. When you take 20 virile young men, most of them aged between 17 and 19, and leave them together for years in a seminary, sexuality will inevitably manifest. I was on a diet of celibacy and loneliness. I had a need for affectivity that was not being met. 
I desired an exclusive relationship which wasn't permitted in a church that valued celibacy above the priesthood. And in this emotional barrenness, I got a glimpse of what my life could be like, freed from isolation and religious constraint. On the 1st of December 1982, I recorded, I've read over 100 pages, indeed closer to 120 pages of An Experience of Celibacy by Keith Clark since bedtime last night. That recently published book, which had just arrived in the Milton Library, was a big hit among seminarians. I was experiencing my loneliness. My desire for sexual pleasure was heightened. I craved an emotionally interdependent, physically expressive relationship. And I realized that these normal yearnings could not be fulfilled while committed to the vow of celibacy. On the 5th of December, I felt the solution was praying and presenting myself to God at such a time as tonight when I want so much to touch another. Humbled, I prayed that my celibacy could testify to the primacy of the love of God in my life. But all I felt was a lonely, burning desire. 